Hello, you're watching Eastern Europe Review, the program with the news and analysis from Belarus, Ukraine and Russia. This is joint production of Belsat TV and TVP World. My name is Mitsur Mitskevich and here are the main topics. Opponents excluded or eliminated one week until Putin's pseudo-elections. We will no longer tolerate criticism of our democracy and claims that it is not what it should be. Our democracy is the best, and we will continue to build it. Vote is closed. The European Union imposes a ban on goods produced by prison labor, no. depriving the Lukashenko regime of another revenue source. These are hundreds of millions of euros, and there are more than 20 countries where products made by political prisoners are delivered. Even substantial funds fail to be effective. The number of Russian volunteers joining the war is dwindling each month. Hundreds of thousands of people have been taken out of the productive economy into unproductive employment, including contract workers and mobilized men, as well as those who have left. March 17, presidential elections will take place in Russia. This is both a major political event and an imitation of an electoral procedure that fails to alter the architecture of the Russian political regime. Putin is set to secure his fifth presidential term. Of that there is no doubt. However, the term elected doesn't fully capture its original meaning, as genuine elections won't take place in Russia. This fact has been widely acknowledged by independent experts without exaggeration. We will no longer tolerate criticism of our democracy and claims that it is not what it should be. Our democracy is the best, and we will continue to build it. The Kremlin is once again mobilizing its administrative resources. And it's not keeping it a secret. Its ruling party, United Russia, which has been created by the Kremlin, has launched a service to monitor voter turnout among dependent voters during elections. State employees whose salaries depend on the state will be monitored, including doctors, teachers, healthcare workers, public utility employees and civil servants. We support the current president, Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. There will be four candidates on the ballot. Vladimir Putin himself is demonstratively participating in the elections as a self-nominated candidate, without being officially affiliated with any party. However, the other three candidates represent parliamentary parties and are largely seen as technical candidates. They imitate real competition, but they themselves do not hope for a victory. <laughs> Not a single genuine candidate openly articulating an anti-war position was permitted. Boris Nadezhdin, for instance, was among those denied nomination for the elections, despite Russians standing in long lines for many hours in 20-degree frost to collect signatures in support of his candidacy. I think we all understand why we came here, because this candidate has expressed a position that resonates with many of those present here. If genuine elections are not held and real candidates are not permitted, will Russians participate in them? In such circumstances, the rationale for participating in elections becomes questionable. Opposition politician Maxim Reznik has proposed the idea of noon against Putin, which was supported by Alexei Navalny right before his death in prison. I like the idea that those voting against Putin will go to the polls at the same time at 12 noon. Noon against Putin. This can be a powerful demonstration of the country's mood. This will be a nationwide protest against Putin, which is taking place near your home. It's available to everyone, everywhere. Millions will be able to take part in it, 
and tens of millions will witness it. After Alexei Navalny's death in prison, his wife Yulia called for the fulfillment of her husband's final political will. We need to use the election day to show that we exist and that there are many of us. We are real, alive. We are real people and we are against Putin. We must come to the polling station on the same day and at the same time, March the 17th at noon. Gathering at polling stations doesn't necessarily mean voting. A person may choose various actions, such as taking a ballot, spoiling it, taking it home, or reluctantly marking the least disagreeable candidate. However, the main objective is that Russians see that they are capable of joint political action. This is to take advantage of a legal and safe procedure to undermine Putin's structure as much as possible. First of all, his structure revolves around the wall, but most importantly, around the illusion that he is the uncontested leader supported by everyone whom Russians want to see as the head of the country. This illusion is maintained both externally and internally, as well as among the people. You can try to shatter this illusion using this legal procedure. These elections are unlikely to bring about immediate change in Russia. However, they present an opportunity for Russians to recognize their ability and willingness to take responsibility for their lives and their country and collectively initiate change from within. The European Union authorities are planning to enforce a complete prohibition on the import and sale of goods produced through forced labor. Although the draft law has not yet been approved, the Lukashenko regime in Belarus, notorious for exploiting prisoners within its economy, should brace itself for yet another setback. Goods produced by forced labor aren't welcome in the European Union market. Vote is closed. The European Parliament and the Council of Europe have reached a preliminary agreement to ban the sale and export of products produced unethically. This could affect Belarusian productions that cooperate with correctional institutions. The fact of sentences and work in prison isn't a violation of international law. But in the Belarusian situation, we have politically motivated judgments, we have political prisoners, which means that these are unjust decisions. So we can talk about forced labor being a fact. These are hundreds of millions of euros, and there are more than 20 countries where products made by political prisoners are delivered. No. According to the International Labour Organization, any type of work or service that is performed under the threat of punishment or involuntarily is considered forced. The ban on the use of forced labour has been established by a number of international acts. Control over products in the European Union will be carried out by the competent authorities of each individual country. A special group of the European Commission will evaluate goods from third countries. If it's proven that a product has been made with the involvement of forced labor, it will be removed from sale or disposed of. If a part of a car is made with forced labor, that part will have to be disposed of, but not the whole car. The car manufacturer will have to find a new supplier for that part or make sure that it is not made with forced labor. However, if tomatoes used to make a sauce are produced using forced labor, all the sauce will have to be disposed of. Producers using forced labor will be included in a special database, which will be based, among other things, on the reports of international human rights organizations. Working in penal colonies is not a way of correcting criminals in prisons as it should be and as it is written in the criminal code. In Belarusian prisons, unfortunately, this is a means of torture. Even sick people are forced to do such work, and there is no option to refuse. Inmates from 27 Belarusian penal colonies are engaged in the production of a wide range of goods, spanning from household items and clothing to furniture, woodwork and metalworking products. The labor of 8,000 prisoners is used in woodworking alone. Often, the prison origin of these goods is not disclosed. 
According to an investigation by the British public organization EarthSight, major retail furniture chains in Europe have been purchasing furniture produced by Belarusian prisoners for years. Media reports have revealed, for example, that IKEA has actively cooperated with Belarusian suppliers who employed prisoner labor. Most often there is some kind of contract between a state or non-state firm and the penal colony. The firm submits a request to the penal colony specifying what they need. There is an industrial zone on the territory of the penal colony where a small, not very difficult part of the production is produced. However, the use of prisoners' labor is openly acknowledged in the domestic market of Belarus. Last year, the Department of Corrections even inaugurated a store that exclusively sells products crafted by prisoners. Nevertheless, goods exported to Europe will now be subject to additional checks for the presence of forced labor. Following a preliminary agreement, the draft measures to counteract the use of forced labor must be officially approved by members of the European Parliament and leaders of the European Union countries. Russia is actively recruiting contractors for the war against Ukraine. The plan to enlist at least 400,000 people in the army has been distributed to the regions. These figures are comparable to last year's. However, the number of people willing to take up arms is dwindling. Therefore, military conscription officers are prepared to accept everyone, including those who have never served in the army. Up to 80 people per week pass through the military service selection point in the Russian city of Saratov, which has a population of nearly a million people. Such data has been provided by employees of the military conscription office. 14 years ago, I did my compulsory military service in the Moscow region, in the Tzushinsky division. I'm not so keen on running now. Maybe I could fly drones. The main incentive attracting people to war is money. While the average salary in Russia is about $700, the monthly salary of a contract soldier starts at $2,300. Authorities promise bonuses for participation in assaults and the seizure of equipment. Payment in reality is often much more modest, and soldiers experience significant delays in receiving their wages. However, what contractors will definitely receive is a lump sum payment from the local budget, which can reach between five to six thousand dollars in some regions. I work at Gazprom as a fitter. I signed up because I need to support my country somehow, to keep the war away from Russia. The main thing is to come back alive and healthy. Saratov is a city in southeastern Russia, situated on the banks of the Volga River, approximately 850 kilometers from Moscow. Numerous factories are located here. While military factories have thrived since the invasion of Ukraine, companies that produced civilian products are closing down production and are implementing salary cuts. However, it appears that even against this backdrop, the authorities will face greater difficulty fulfilling the plan to recruit contractors this year compared to last year. People motivated by patriotic reasons to join the military are becoming scarce. The number of individuals willing to risk their lives or risk becoming disabled, even for a substantial compensation, is limited. Consequently, the military is prepared to enlist anyone who meets minimal health requirements. Contracted service is open to men from 18 years old who are fit according to the Medical Commission. It doesn't matter whether they have done compulsory military service before or not. Women aged 18 and above, both medical and non-medical professionals, can sign up as well. Meanwhile, the desire to meet the quota for recruiting contract soldiers for the war at any cost has already resulted in a significant personnel shortage in various regions of Russia. Hundreds of thousands of people have been taken out of the productive economy into unproductive employment, including contract workers and mobilized men, as well as those who have left. Now many have returned, but hundreds of thousands remain absent. This has led to a severe labor market deficit. It exists. 
and it is indeed substantial. According to the expert, there are scarcely any remaining labor resources within the economy. After the presidential elections, scheduled for mid-March, Russia may initiate a new mobilization of its male population. Many military analysts are discussing the possibility of such mobilization. Such a governmental decision could pose a substantial risk to production across industries beyond defense, potentially resulting in production halts. That's all for today. Eastern Europe Preview will be back next Sunday. Please stay with TVP World and stand with Ukraine.